Information, please. <laughs> Wake up, Mr. and Mrs. America. Time to stop the experts. The battle royal between the public and the experts is on again, in which the much quizzed public turn the tables and quiz the experts. In this new national pastime, you get the opportunity to try and flunk the professors who have always tried to flunk you. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, to make the revenge taste even sweeter, if you succeed in flunking the experts, you will be rewarded with a $5 prize. If you want to take part in this new popular national game, here's how it's done. Send us questions and the correct answers. If acceptable to our editors, they will be presented to a board of experts for the first time during each broadcast. Questions accepted will win $2 each for the person who submits them, and any questions the experts cannot answer will be rewarded with an extra $5. The contest of the public versus the experts will be refereed by Dr. John Erskine. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. John Erskine. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have before us in the studio an intelligent audience and four brave men who will try to answer any question asked by anybody in the United States. You've just heard them called experts. That name will do for the present. The four experts this evening are Franklin P. Adams, columnist of the New York Post, Marcus Duffield, day news editor of the Herald Tribune, Bernard Jaffe, head of the physical science department of the Bushwick High School, and John Kieran, sports columnist of the New York Times. Mr. Kieran is our special guest of honor. He'll get the hard questions. Each of these experts is at home in his field and ambitious in all the others. Mr. Adams is a great reader of books. He is also a writer of books. I don't refer to the same books. <laughs> He is also an expert in tennis and pocket billiards, as he confessed here last week. And since you read his column, you know he translates Horace from time to time and is fiendishly adroit in detecting a misprint or a mistaken spelling. In appearance, he is solemn, if not sinister. <laughs> he sits nearest to me at the end of the line. And this evening, he's wearing a gray suit and a blue tie which stands for truth. <laughs> Mr. Duffield is remarkably informed about current events, but I understand that archaeology and prize fights have each an appeal for him. And when he is bored with politics, he reads science for relaxation. He sits at the other end of the line. In appearance, he is youthful and optimistic. And this evening, he wears a dark greenish suit with a grayish shirt and a brownish tie. <laughs> Mr. Jaffe, who sits next to him, really knows science, but he is prepared to throw light on literature, music, sculpture, and poker. <laughs> In appearance, he is youthful but settled, and he wears a brown suit with a light brown tie, which doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Mr. Kieran, our guest of honor, is, as you know, a sports columnist. He sits next to Mr. Adams. That is, if you know the natural tendency of sports columnists, he is probably on the way to be a dramatic or literary critic, an authority on social, political, and economic questions, <laughs> and on off days a humorist. <laughs> I stand in awe of him. In spite of his gray hair, he has the eager look of the insatiable young. <laughs> and he can ask pointed questions as well as answer them. He wears a brown coat this evening with a spotted brown tie, which means the sporting spirit. <laughs> These experts haven't seen the questions in advance. The questions will be addressed to all of them. Any one of them may raise his hand. If the question is composed of more than two parts, the four experts may consult among themselves. If any question or any part of a question is answered incorrectly, five dollars is forfeited. When you hear the cash register ring, you will know five dollars is being paid out to the lucky questioner. 
If there's any money left at the end, the experts will share it as a bonus. Here in the studio, a number of people are waiting to ask the questions they sent in. Questions received from out-of-town listeners will be presented by your chairman. Just a second now. You hear that sound? That's the experts. The brains of the experts. <laughs> beginning to click. And here's the first question. From Mr. Fred Payton Green of Buffalo, New York. The following questions refer to well-known old-time songs. Answer any four of them. First, what was everybody doing in the song, Everybody's Doing It? Second, what happens after the ball is over? Third, where did boys and girls together trip the light fantastic? Four, into what vehicle was Josephine invited in the song, Come Josephine? Five, Upon what seat, where she looks sweet, was Daisy invited to sit? <laughs> now, can you remember those questions, children, or shall I read them again? Read them again. Number one, <laughs> Mr. Adams, six for the boy. What was everybody doing in the song, Everybody's Doing It? Two, what happens after the ball is over? Three, do it one at a time. And I'll get them. Do one at, one at a time and I'll answer Fine. Mr. Adams volunteered. One. What was everybody doing in the song, Everybody's Doing It? Turkey trot. Correct. Two. What happens after the ball is over? Many a heart is breaking. Correct. <laughs> it's aching, but that's near enough. Three. <laughs> What's the question? Where did boys and girls together trip the light fantastic? On the sidewalks of NY. Right. <laughs> Four. Into what vehicle was Josephine invited in the song, Come Josephine? In my flying machine. Absolutely correct. And you have four. I'm glad question. to sing them. Next I'd part. be very glad to sing all of them. <laughs> That's where we part. <laughs> Next question from Miss Pauline Goldstein, Malden, Massachusetts. In what sports are the following terms used? Timing, football, huddle, squeeze play, and puck. Uh, just call them over again and I'll Mr. answer them. Karen will finish these off. Timing. And golf. Football, tennis, huddle, football, please play, baseball, puck, hockey. That's very easy for me. I need the help of Mr. Adams. I'll ask him to repeat in a loud voice these words. Hello, folks. It was a tough fight. Mr. Adams, if you please. Hello, folks. It was a tough fight. Yes. Now, here's the question. Who was the first to hear that statement made by Mr. Adams? The people sitting here in the rear of this studio or the people listening to this program in Los Angeles? Mr. Jaffe. The people listening over in Los Angeles. You want the reason for it? Yes. You don't need to give it, but we'd like to hear it. Well, I'll give the reason. <laughs> Radio waves travel at a much faster pace than sound waves. <clears throat> in fact, sound travels 1,100 feet a second. And radio waves travel 186,000 miles a second. Next question is from Mrs. Alice Guzzi, Wadsworth, Ohio. Name four ex-sovereigns, each of whom now is a man without a country. I'll try. I'll take a chance Duffy. on that, Mr. Dr. Erskine. Uh, Alfonso of Spain... Right. Um, uh, Edward the Eighth of England, 
Very good. Prajata poke of Siam. How about a little help there? Yes, a little help out about the Nagus of Ethiopia. Good idea. Also the German Emperor. Well. That helps us out. Except for Germany. That's right. We that's enough. That We have him down on the list, but that's all right. Four kings. Four kings. Good here. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question from Mrs. Walter Guile of New York City. Now, this is a good one. Why might a gentleman pass up a date with a melanotroic female? I will repeat. The one important word, melanotroic. How do you spell it? M E L A N O C H R O I C. Melanotroic. I'd be afraid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Adams, rising. Well, you never heard of him? <laughs> Mr. Sterling. What kind of man would it be that would be afraid of? Meeting this woman? Now, don't dodge it yourself, so, Mr. Curran. Well, uh, melano, well, that comes from the Greek meaning black, doesn't Correct. it? Correct. And what does uh, Freud come from? I, uh, that's also a Greek word, I should say, on account of the C-H in there, but uh, what it uh, means... I told you, Mr. Curran was a wonder, you see. He's up on the feet. Uh, but it's, uh, what the heroic part means, I don't know, and uh, I think when you don't know, it's a good idea not to keep a date with a woman. Heroic is what a bird does. I don't get the logic, but the general idea is correct. Does, does the board all, all hands up? All right. I'll tell them for the information that the melon was all right, that means black or dark, and the croix means skin. And the name is applied by anthropologists to all dark-skinned people, and some gentlemen prefer blonde. <laughs> Next question. From Mrs. Wittich, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Here are four streets, each of which is associated with a famous character of literature. Can you name three of them? First, Baker Street, 2nd, Wimpole Street, 3rd, Quality Street, 4, Main Street. Mr. Karen again. Why, well, uh, just call them off. 1st, uh, Baker Street. That's the uh, residence of uh, uh, the uh, famous uh, detective uh, in fiction, uh, Sherlock Holmes. That's right. Now, the next one was what? Wimpole, Wimpole Street. Oh, well, that's... Uh, Barrett. Yes. Quality Street. Uh, I'll skip that one. I'm not quite sure. But Main Street, of course, is uh, uh, your red-headed friend novelist. What's his name? Mr. Lewis. Lewis. Well, <coughs> you you are you you're right, Mr. Karen. The uh, Wimpole Wimpole Street in the uh, play on the Barrett's. And Quality Street, Barry's play, the character was Phoebe Throssell that you were dodging there. And the Kennecott's were the people in Main Street. Very good class. Next question. From Mr. Robert... <laughs> Mr. Robert Ensel, Weehawken, New Jersey. I spent my childhood and youth in Weehawken. I'm interested in this question. What man who later became president of the United States was defeated as candidate for vice president. What man who later became president of the United States was defeated as candidate for vice president? Mr. Duffy. I believe it was Mr. John Adams, the second president. I think he ran as vice president in the beginning. Doesn't sound right, uh, but no, by don't your luck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Thought you were up on current events, Mr. Duffy. Fast oh, up. sure. Franklin Donald Roosevelt. Well, that's quite right. Yeah. Should All have right. tried that cricket. Yeah. <laughs> he was defeated as vice president, and now he happens to be president. Now, here's 
this one to Mr. Jack Levine of Toronto, Canada. And he's here to ask it himself. If someone went into a store and bought something made up of a piece of wood, glucose, water, and the fruit of the theobroma tree, what would he get? That's a stunning question. I'll, I'll, I'll read it again to see if I understand it. If someone went into a store and bought something made up of a piece of wood, glucose, water, and the fruit of the theobroma tree, <laughs> what would he get? I think I have it. Mr. I'd like to have it anyway. Mr. Johnson. Right. It's a nice big lollipop. That's right. <laughs> Jaffe forgot to tell us the flavoring. It would be chocolate flavored. But that was that was pretty close. Now so far, the penalties are, are very light the class are holding out. Is that five? Uh, we've lost five dollars so far. <laughs> uh, I mean the, the question is have won five so far. Now what would be the correct strategy in the following imaginary play of football? You are receiving a kickoff just behind your own goal line. The ball bounces off your hands and rolls to a stop in the end zone. Should you fall on it, run it out, or let it alone? Well, it doesn't make sure you should sure. fall on it. Why? You shoot the last that is, that is, that is. Well, it's a touchback. Right. Yes. There's Correct. no play on it. Correct. Right. Now we rise to another realm entirely. I don't know what we rise. This is a question from Mrs. Priscilla La Palla in New York City. Give the names of famous philosophers which rhyme, whose names rhyme, with the following. Tomato, Barbara Fritchie, Bottle, Whiskey Sour, and Snooty Dane. <laughs> Try them one by one. I think, how many do you want there? Four? How many names do you want? Well, the question asks for the name. How far can you go? Just ask. What is the first one? Tomato. Plato. Great. What's the second? Barbara Fritchie. Nietzsche. Great. Bob for the third. Aristotle. Great. Schopenhauer. Ha! <laughs> 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 You'll win. Snooty <laughs> Dane. I imagine that's uh, William James. You're correct, and I apologize. <laughs> you would have been correct on the other. Now, is an oxygen tank necessary to sustain human life in the troposphere? This question comes from Edward Harrington, Philadelphia. I'll take that, uh, Dr. Oyskin. Mr. Jaffe. An oxygen tank is not necessary in a troposphere. The troposphere extends to a height of about five or six miles. And life can be sustained without oxygen there. Wow. The class is very solid tonight. <coughs> Next question from Miss Margaret Lawrence, New York City. Name a poet, a prize fighter, and an aviator whose names are strikingly appropriate to their profession. A poet, a prize fighter, and an aviator whose names are strikingly appropriate to their profession. Try the poet first. Well, there was a poet named Akenside. <laughs> I'll, I'll rule that correct. I have the aviator, Dr. Grayson. Frank Hawks. 
Beg your pardon? Frank Hawks for the aviator. Frank. We still have a prize fighter. Prize fighter. Well, I don't know whether he's a prize fighter or not, but he goes in the ring, and his name is Bear. Max Bear. <laughs> I don't think I qualify this year. There's a penalty, I think. Well, I think there's a, a fighter. He's not very good. A good one named Stryker. <laughs> you don't mean Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 I'm reminded I should tell you what we were fishing for here. A prize fighter named Armstrong. <laughs> That's a better name for a detective. <laughs> Next question. I think to be asked from the studio, I'm not sure, Mr. Wally Freed of New York. Mr. Freed. Will you name the Supreme Court Justice appointed by President Roosevelt in his first administration and one in his second administration? question is, can we name the Supreme Court Justice appointed by the President Roosevelt in his first administration and an appointment in the second administration? I think I Mr. can answer it. I'll try anyhow. I'll give the second one first. I'm yeah. sure of that. That's Justice, Mr. Justice Black. And I think that uh, Mr. Justice Cardoso was appointed during his first term. Yeah. Well, um, one error. One error. Very sorry. One hit. No appointments in the first administration. Mr. Hoover appointed Mr. Cardoso. And in the second administration, I think the question was a little bit tricky. Uh, I should say so. It was Mr. Black. There's also Mr. Reed was in that. And there are two in the second administration, none in the first. Next question, Miss Helen Rugen, New York City. She offers us the following unfamiliar second stanza of a very famous poem. And we're going to ask the experts to supply the first stanza. Now, this is the second stanza. One day she went upstairs when her mother, unawares, was in the kitchen, occupied with meals. And she stood upon her head in her little trundle bed and then began hurrying with her heels. First stanza. That's the second. <laughs> They're all shaking their heads. Never heard of it in their lives. Give up. Give up. Answer. Give up. There was a little girl, and she had a little curl. <laughs> the experts look particularly blank. I'll give them a moment to recover. Here's a question from Mr. Luke Raviella. From Aston, New York. Select four of the following and tell us what sort of creature each one is. Now listen carefully. Number one, the laughing jackass. Two, the titmouse. Three, the ladybird. Four, the chuckwill's widow. And five, the brown creeper. Mr. Kieran. You have to tell all five of them? <coughs> no. Select four. All right. You call them all. Number now. one, the laughing jackass. That's a bird. A bird. Correct. Two, titmouse. Well, that's another bird. Correct. Right around here. Three, lady. <laughs> I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon? Three, ladybird. I don't know that I one. I know that one. Mr. Jaffe. That's a beetle. Correct, Mr. Jaffe. The... Chuck Will's widow. That's uh, the uh, southern equivalent of our whippoorwill of this area. Correct. And five brown creeper. This brown creeper is a small accessorine bird that uh, feeds on uh, insects. <laughs> Absolutely correct. <clears throat> and I 
I don't know how with so much brains in the in the class we have piled up a total number of penalties, twenty dollars. So easy come, easy go. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Well, Mrs. Herbert J. Hayes, Waterbury, Connecticut. With what person do you associate each of the following phrases? Number one, the little flower. Two, the greatest showman on earth. Three, the Swedish nightingale. Four, the wizard of Menlo Park. And five, old hickory. Oh, no. <laughs> But who put up your hand first, children? I didn't see. Was it Mr. Duffield there? Mr. Duffield? That's right. Number one, the little flower. Piero Lagardia. Number two, the greatest showman on earth. The Barnum. Number three, Swedish Nightingale. Florence, uh, oh, wait a minute, huh? <laughs> well, go on to the next. I'll think of her when I come back. <laughs> Four, the Wizard of Menlo Park. Thomas A. Edison. Five, Old Hickory. Andrew Jackson. And three, the Swedish Nightingale. Oh, you're back there again. Let's <laughs> bring it together. Jenny Lynn. <laughs> Just try the impromptu duet for Mr. Garrett <coughs> Mr. Adams. <coughs> Next question. The Nightingale to the Bronx. <laughs> from Mr. C.F. Smith. Brooklyn, New York, and I think it's here. Explain three of the following <coughs> slang expressions, telling the game from which it was derived. One, behind the eight ball. Two, he couldn't get to first base. Three, ace in the hole. Four, four flusher. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read the question again, though I'd, uh, if I had time, I'd argue with Mr. Smith as to whether they are slang expressions. I believe they are professional and highly technical. The first is behind the eight ball. Second, he couldn't get to first base. Third is ace in the hole. Four is four flusher. And the jury of the class are asked to explain the meaning of three of them. I yield to Mr. Adams. Mr. Kieran yields to Mr. Adams. Behind the eight ball is supposed to come from pool, but it doesn't. It comes from a game called eight ball, which is uh, a black ball and uh, is uh, <coughs> roughly uh, stymies the player. What's the other one? The next is he couldn't get to first base. That comes from the game of American baseball. Uh, three, uh, ace in the hole... Stud poker. And four, four flusher. Draw poker. And what does it mean? Well, it's supposed to mean a, uh, a man who uh, is not, is uh, pretentious. And who uh, hasn't got That's all correct. the cards. That's correct. We have one more question here, and the time's getting short. I think you'd like to hear this from Mr. Jack Lippman, Brooklyn. I think he's here. Is Mr. Lippman here? If not, I'll read his question. Which of the following foods contains the highest percentage of water? Milk, macaroni, or oysters? The oyster. Mr. Jaffe is right. We now know... Whether to begin the meal with milk or oysters, or feed the child oysters or milk. Penalties, total oysters penalties, too, 20, and I, I must hurry on and tell you that we have no more questions for tonight. Total penalties, 20. I offer you our thanks, members of the board, all the folks that have submitted questions. Mr. Cross has a word for you about next week's contest. Good night, everybody, and come again. Thank you. The board of experts will include FPA, Franklin P. Adams, Marcus Duffield, Bernard Jaffe, and our guest of honor, Mark Connolly, author of Green Pastures. This is the National Broadcast.